Okay, here we are for the last segment of Chapter 4. Hopefully you've enjoyed uh, the nuclear chemistry topics uh, so far, and we'll round things out here with a discussion of the differences between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. So these are terms you've probably heard, nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, uh, and again, they're very similar sounding terms. Uh, and they both involve uh, nuclear processes, uh, and um, therefore it's important that you uh, try your best to distinguish the two because they are very different processes and um, processes that uh, we've used so far for nuclear energy have been fission-based. Uh, processes that we'd like to use in the future would be fusion-based, and we'll talk about the reasons uh, why we would prefer fusion to fission as we uh, complete our discussion of each process. Okay, so before we start to distinguish uh, between nuclear fission and fusion, and I've already given away uh, a lot by saying that fusion is the more desirable of the two, let's first focus on nuclear fission. Uh, nuclear fission uh, has a large nucleus that's bombarded with a small particle and that causes this large nucleus to split into smaller nuclei uh, and typically several neutrons as well, free neutrons, and then large amounts of energy are released uh, because there's a lot, a lot of energy, what we call binding energy, that was keeping that nucleus together. When we split that nucleus apart into smaller nuclei, we release some of that binding energy uh, and typically this is done uh, either to capture that energy uh, in the case of fission-based power plants, or to uh, use that energy for its destructive power in the case of fission-based bombs. Okay, so whether we're talking about nuclear power plants or nuclear bombs, uh, oftentimes we're dealing with uh, uranium-235 in either of those applications, uh, and we have a neutron bombarding U-235 uh, in either case to uh, first form an unstable nucleus of U-236, right? We haven't changed the identity of the element because uh, that neutron that gets absorbed by the U-235 nucleus, uh, it's a neutron, so it's just going to increase the mass number by one. Uh, and then uh, it's going to uh, result in fission because that uh, new nucleus, U-236, is uh, quite unstable. Uh, U-235's a radioactive isotope already, and now we have an even less stable nucleus here of U-236. Uh, the smaller nuclei that are produced, uh, like uh, Krypton-91 and Barium-142, uh, are also uh, accompanied by more neutrons. So if we have uh, U-235 present and we uh, bombard it with a, a neutron to get things started, we create additional neutrons that are going to react with additional U-235s in a chain reaction. So uh, this is going to be uh, something that can either be done in a controlled manner, uh, in the case of a nuclear power plant, where we have control rods, boron-10 rods, that can absorb those neutrons and slow down the process, or if we're dealing with a nuclear weapon, uh, then the whole point is to have that uncontrolled chain reaction and very quickly uh, have the uh, energy produced by lots and lots of U-235 nuclei decaying all at once. And here we see a visual of that process. So uh, we have that single, what we call a thermal neutron, and that's why we use U-235, because it's known as a fissile material, which means a low-energy neutron will cause this process, whereas U-238 uh, would involve a really high-energy neutron to try to coax its nucleus into this sort of decay process. So that uh, neutron hits the U-235 nucleus, uh, makes that unstable U-236 nucleus, uh, decays into the Krypton-91, barium-142, and then three neutrons and those, and lots and lots of energy, uh, of course, and those three neutrons are now free to find three new uranium-235 nuclei uh, and uh, spread this chain reaction uh, in either as I said, a controlled way where you have boron control rods that can absorb those uh, neutrons and slow down the process and ultimately stop it if things got uncontrolled in the nuclear reactor. Uh, or uh, the whole purpose of this would be to cause that chain reaction uh, in the case of a nuclear weapon. Let's pause here and check your understanding of nuclear fission by having you complete 
the uh, nuclear equation here in uh, this learning check. So we have a neutron plus a U-235 nucleus uh, decaying in this case to a technetium-137 nucleus plus another nucleus uh, plus two neutrons and lots of energy. So your challenge is to figure out what that missing nucleus is. Go ahead and pause the video at this stage and once you've determined the identity uh, go ahead and start back up and we'll see how you did. Okay, so hopefully you arrived at Zirconium 97 as your result. So you had to know a couple of things here. First of all, you had to know that that energy that's produced, we don't really quantify that. It doesn't count as a mass number or a proton number uh, in the equation. So we can sort of ignore it, understand that it's important because it's a lot of energy and uh, there's probably a reason why uh, we did this, either to produce energy for nuclear power or for uh, nuclear weapons but it's really just the particles that matter. So the neutron and the uranium uh, nucleus on the left-hand side, and then the technetium, the unknown nucleus, and the uh, neutrons on the right-hand side. So we had a total of mass number of 236 on the left, right? The one mass number of the neutron and the 235 mass number of the uranium. Uh, and so uh, we had two neutrons that gave us two mass numbers on the right hand side plus technetium 137 gave us 139 so 236 minus 139 gives us 97 so that's how we arrived at the mass number if we look down below at the uh, proton number the atomic number uh, we had zero from the neutron on the left plus 92 from the uranium that we started with and then we had zero for those two neutrons on the right hand side uh, 52 for technetium uh, 92 minus 52 gave us 40 so once we knew we had 40 protons we could look at the periodic table and arrive at zirconium which is element number 40 so that's how we knew that the product that we were unsure of our question mark there in the learning check must be zirconium 97. Hopefully that was not too difficult for you. And if you did struggle, hopefully this explanation uh, helps. But please do try additional problems if you are having trouble. And uh, certainly don't be afraid to reach out to me for help if it's just not making sense. Okay, so we talked about that idea of a chain reaction with uh, you have something like a neutron and a U-235 nucleus uh, interacting to form additional neutrons and other product uh, nuclides. The uh, problem there is that if you use one neutron and produce three neutrons that are now able to go on and react with additional uh, uranium-235 nuclei, uh, this process can get out of control very quickly. And there's a certain amount that you can have present uh, and be able to stop this process with the control rods, as we said, in a nuclear power plant. That's why we deal with very small amounts of the uh, fissile U-235 in a power plant. We don't want uh, these chain reactions to go uncontrolled. On the other hand, a nuclear reactor, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a nuclear uh, weapon is really just two subcritical amounts of the, in the case of uranium, the U-235, uh, and then a chemical explosive that will force them together very quickly. We have to have the subcritical amounts uh, because we don't want the bomb going off before it reaches its intended target. Uh, and then uh, once it does reach the intended target, the chemical explosives force those two subcritical masses together. And now you have a critical mass that can't help but undergo a very rapid chain reaction. Uh, and unfortunately, we've demonstrated this in tests and in wartime and uh, hopefully we, we won't be doing that again anytime soon because you have very long-lived, highly radioactive uh, daughter nuclides as a result. Uh, and uh, that's why there are regions uh, in uh, Japan where the uh, nuclear weapons were used that uh, still register very high radioactive counts because of the uh, long-lived daughter nuclides of this process. So uh, again, the nuclear power plant application is a much greener and uh, friendlier use of nuclear uh, reactivity. And in nuclear power plants in use today, uh, fission is used to produce the energy. 
uh, control rods, boron-10 is the particular isotope because when it absorbs a neutron, it becomes boron-11, which is another stable isotope of boron. So you don't get uh, any uh, issues if you're using the boron control rods to uh, absorb neutrons and slow down, control the chain reaction so that it doesn't get out of hand. Uh, the um, problem that I mentioned with the nuclear weapons, uh, that idea of the sorts of uh, radioactive daughter nuclides, is also a problem in nuclear power plants. Fission-based power plants do produce that uh, radioactive waste, uh, and we do have to deal with it. Um, they don't produce carbon emissions, so uh, from a greenhouse gas standpoint, uh, nuclear power plants are eco-friendly, I suppose, but on the other hand, the uh, daughter nuclides that they make that are highly radioactive uh, do have to be um, stored. They're going to be radioactive for many, many years, uh, and we have to do something with them. First of all, uh, we have to make sure that the wrong people don't get them because they could be used to make radioactive weapons. Uh, and secondly, we need to make sure that they're safely handled and stored until they uh, decay into ultimately stable products. So uh, fission-based reactors are all we have right now, and they do a good job of producing energy, uh, but they do have uh, the issues of the type of waste that they generate. Okay, so then uh, we should probably talk about nuclear fusion uh, because it generates far less harmful waste, uh, and it's ultimately the uh, desirable type of uh, nuclear reaction that we would want for the power plants of the future. Nuclear fusion occurs at extremely high temperatures, uh, something on the order of a million degrees Celsius. Uh, it combines small nuclei into larger nuclei, so it's the opposite process. Fission, we took the large nuclei and we split them into smaller nuclei. Here we're taking the small nuclei and fusing them together into larger nuclei. Uh, this, like fission, releases very large amounts of energy, um, and this is what's uh, occurring right now uh, in our sun, right, in other stars. We've got uh, nuclei, in the case of our sun, we have tritium, hydrogen-3, a, a proton with two neutrons in the nucleus of these hydrogen atoms. You're combining them with deuterium, uh, hydrogen-2, a proton and a neutron. Uh, and you're making helium, uh, nucleus of a helium atom, an alpha particle, uh, plus a neutron, plus lots and lots of energy. So uh, this is desirable, right? Helium as a byproduct is, is harmless. Uh, it's not anything, at least for helium-4, a stable nucleus of helium, we don't have the same storage and uh, radioactivity concerns that we have for the products of nuclear fission. So fusion seems ideal. Uh, just a couple of problems, right? First of all, those extremely high temperatures. No problem for the sun, but uh, here on Earth to reach those conditions, we got to put in a lot of energy to get there in the first place, uh, and we have to use strong magnetic fields to control uh, the, uh, pro the uh, reactants that we want to produce that nuclear fusion product. Um, the other problem, uh, if you remember, our symbol for a proton is either the um, 1 plus 1 P or 1 1 H, uh, a hydrogen atom. So the overwhelming majority of hydrogen uh, is hydrogen 1, what's known as protium. So these hydrogen 2, the deuterium, and hydrogen 3, tritium, these are very small amounts of naturally occurring hydrogen. Uh, they're uh, therefore, um, you know, very difficult to come by. We have to uh, consider that when we're thinking about how we're going to get the uh, the uh, precursors, right, the, the tritium and deuterium to uh, fuel this sort of nuclear fusion. So it does have its problems, and we uh, have not been able to work them out so far. Nuclear fusion has been done on the lab scale here on Earth, uh, but nothing on the order of uh, what we would need for a nuclear power plant. So there are challenges out there, and hopefully uh, future scientists will meet those challenges and uh, allow nuclear fusion to be a possibility here on Earth. But until then, we enjoy the energy from nuclear fusion in our sun uh, and uh, hope maybe uh, use that solar energy from our reactor safely 93 million miles away instead of uh, trying to uh, create nuclear fusion reactors here on Earth before we have the scientific capability to do so safely.
Okay, so let's round out chapter four here with a final learning check. In this learning check, we're going to indicate if each of the following describes nuclear fission or fusion or both. So um, A says a nucleus splits. Uh, B, large amounts of energy are released. C, small nuclei form larger nuclei. D, hydrogen nuclei react. And E, several neutrons are released. So for each of those, go ahead and uh, determine if that describes fusion, fission, or both. Pause the video here, and then we'll see how you did. All right, so for A, where a nucleus splits, hopefully you identified that as fission, right? Uh, fission involves a large nucleus splitting into smaller nuclei. For B, large amounts of energy are released. Well, that's true of both fission and fusion, so hopefully you caught that subtlety. C, small nuclei form larger nuclei. Well, that's fusion. The small nuclei fuse into a larger nucleus. D, hydrogen nuclei react. That's also fusion. We talked about the tritium and deuterium isotopes of hydrogen reacting to form helium. And then finally, E, several neutrons are released. Uh, that's where we discussed fission, uh, if specifically fission of the uranium-235, uh, where it takes one neutron to uh, cause the U-235 nucleus to decay, and that process uh, produces three neutrons. So if you are having trouble with these, again, it's, it's mainly just a matter of keeping the idea of fissions, uh, uh, large nucleus splitting into smaller nuclei, separate from the idea of fusion, which is pretty self-explanatory, uh, two small nuclei fuse into a larger nucleus. Um, continue to, to try practice problems and uh, reach out to me if you're having trouble with this or any of the other topics we've discussed here in nuclear chemistry. Uh, if things are going well, and I hope they are, uh, then well, we'll see each other again for Chapter 5.